Welcome. Your regular uncle, Kemini Amano, is unavoidably absent and for the duration I'll be standing in until she returns. My name is Felicity Ezewike. Now, the Soweto member, co members of a community there believe that there is a serial killer on the loose after the bodies of two minors were discovered near schools in Rockville and White City last week. Some of the community members who spoke to the press say they are living in fear and have come to believe that the deaths might be mooty killings because the bodies of the children were mutilated and body parts, including genitalia, nose and lips, were missing. The police seem to agree. That wasn't the only recent killings. Seven women and three men, all of them from the same family, were fatally shot outside the city of Peter Maritzburg in KwaZulu Natal. Police say the youngest victim was a 13-year-old boy. Communities are taking to self-defense now, accusing the police of failing them over and over again. Why do these killings persist? Is the distrust of the security apparatus in South Africa encouraging the continued spike in crimes? Can that relationship be repaired? Are concerns over increase to gun access to gun and its impact on crime being taken seriously enough? Joining our gathering today are William Els, a Senior Training Coordinator, Institute for Security Studies, Pretoria, South Africa, and Crazon Bosch, Democratic Alliance member of the Gauteng Provincial Legislature, Johannesburg, also in South Africa. Thank you for joining us on the square. All right. Thank you. Um, let's begin with you, uh, William. Is there any update that you're aware of on the Soweto boys killing and that of the 10 family members? Uh, good afternoon to you. There's no update uh, up, to, up to now, uh, but we know that the police will keep us updated as is the norm in recent days since we experienced quite a spate in, 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 in killings. And, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, the uh, murder rate in South Africa uh, from 2012, you know, it, 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 it rose by, by, by 62% uh, 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 in, in this period. So, so killings in South Africa is fairly common. And uh, I think today we will maybe have the opportunity to, to unpack a little bit about why that is happening. Rephrase that and ask, what is the police saying at the moment? Has there been any sort of arrest to your knowledge um, on either murder? Uh, of that case, I do not bear any knowledge. I haven't looked at the news in, in recent hours for an update. Uh, but we normally see that uh, in, in incidents like this, uh, they are fairly, fairly often that we have uh, arrests. Maybe one has been shot and then uh, you have an arrest and then there are some, some arrests that will follow. Uh, because, you know, in those communities, the people know each other and also the criminals are fairly known to the police and the community uh, that perpetrate these acts. Chris, now let's, let's come to you and get, um, you're, you're closer to this, I, I believe, you're a member of the legislature. Now, there is this uh, talk about muti killings when it comes to the two young people that were killed. Um, what, for, for the benefit of viewers who might not be aware of this, what really is a muti killing and why is it being discussed every time we have mutilated bodies surface? Okay, well, um, with regards to multi killing specifically, it's normally when they take body parts of, especially um, in most cases, young um, young people, like children, babies, etc. But it also sometimes uh, often stretches to um, to virgin females, where they where they will take the body parts of that person and use them for medicine um, in the you know the strong traditional cultures, etc. So. Um, so this is sometimes what multi killings are about, is where they where they try and kill someone to use their body parts to um, to generate and formulate medicine for traditional purposes. Uh, in this specific case, um, I visited the family on Saturday uh, with our provincial leader and caucus leader in the Gauteng le legislature um, to just engage the family as to what exactly happened and what they found. And I mean, it's quite terrible to think that the last image that that family would have of the children is that of a mutilated body. 
that they had to go and identify um, in this case. So uh, these, there was three boys that was um, abducted, uh, you know, on first Wednesday evening, and one boy escaped, and two of the boys um, were killed, and uh, they they lost their body parts. Uh, I, you know, we did elaborate a little bit that on a previous interview. Um, and the third boy is at this stage receiving counselling and working with the police to try and, um, you know, see if we can't uh, get enough evidence as to and to, to catch the, the the perpetrators in this case, the murderers. I'll stay with you. Um, what is being done uh, at the legislative level to um, ensure proper protection and safety for minors in Soweto? For in, in, for in this instance, now in the light of these murders, what are the provisions for that and how is it being implemented? Well, at this stage, uh, the reality is that the police department is highly under-resourced, both physically as well as human resources. There's just not enough um, resources within the police department to address crime. This is something that we have been looking into and um, trying to take up and champion to say that the policing powers needs to be, be devolved to provincial and municipal levels um, so that, you know, the relevant uh, allocation of resources can be decided by the legislature itself and the Department for, for Community Safety and when it's not determined on a national level. Um, there is various different task teams that is um, available, but sometimes these task teams are, are merely a task team on paper, not necessarily something that is implemented in action um, purely because they don't have the resources. At this stage, we, you know, the police stations in Gauteng alone has got anything between 15 to 50 percent of a vacancy rate um, where they don't even have sufficient people to assist with crime intelligence. Crime intelligence within the Department of Gauteng for Community and Safety and Security um, at this stage has, a, has got a very large, like up to 80 percent um, vacancy rate at this stage. And for something like multi killings, you need to do proper profiling of the criminals. You need to do proper profiling of the murderers to be able to to trace, um, you know, a, a trend of what's going on all the different cases to catch the perpetrator at the end of the day. At this stage, they cannot do the proper profiling purely because of a lack of knowledge and lack of people. And um, this is something that we, in as a DA in the legislature, as well as in national government, is trying to fight as hard as we can to get proper resources allocated and proper training and development so that they can assist the communities to keep the community safe. Okay, uh, before I come to you, uh, William, I want to ask specifically for the family of these, you, you said yourself how sad uh, it is and you visited the family. Has there been um, more support from government to this family in terms of um, psychological, psychosocial, any kind of support really? Well, various political parties has gone out to the families to visit them and to pay respect um, and to engage the families as to what happened. From our side, from the Democratic Alliance side, um, we have engaged government to see um, and the various different departments so that we can arrange for a counselling to the families itself. Um, on Saturday, I could see firsthand how traumatised grandmother is. And I think often in South Africa, we are desensitised to the impact um, of these crimes on a family and on humanity itself. And the lasting effects such a crime has on a community and on a family itself. And we, we tend to read about it in the newspapers and you move on. You don't think about the lasting impact it has. And we did commit um, and we are in the process of arranging counselling for the families so that they can have proper um, support and counselling and, you know, to, to be able to talk through the system. The one family, the grandmother that spoke to her, she already lost her son um, who, was, who also died recently, not too long ago. And this grandchild that was staying with her was basically the only resemblance that she still has, um, you know, from her own son. Um, so, you know, that, that was a clear indication that, that they really do need support and, and proper counselling to assist them going forward. And from our side, we will be doing everything in our, in our power to ensure that that counselling does take place and that the relevant social workers goes out to the homes um, to provide them with the counselling, not only this week, but in coming weeks to come. 
All right, Williams, let me, let me ask you about your assessment, because there seems to be an increasing level of crime. The more you see, you're trying to come back to one, something else uh, is happening. From your uh, perspective, what is your, the measures being implemented to combat crime in South Africa? What is your assessment of its effectiveness and some of the areas that needs to change? I think uh, uh, you, you have to stand back and, and, and look at the bigger picture. You know, over, over the past 10 years, there was a 72% increase in the budget allocated to the police. But what Prezon just rightly mentioned, so there's an 80% vacancy in the crime intelligence in Part 10. You know, that, that points squarely to me, uh, to our management uh, challenges that we have. I think South Africa has got a serious manage, management challenge in terms of policing uh, since 1994. Every national commissioner that has been appointed has, has, has either left under a cloud or has been arrested for corruption, and that includes the, the current minister of police. So, you know, fish rot from the head. So we can we can talk uh, till, till, uh, tomorrow and, and try to find solutions. We have to start at the problem, and the problem, according to our research, is it, it starts at the top. And if we we cannot sort out the management challenges. We're going to sit with the biggest budget in Africa for policing, but we won't be able to curb crime because there's no leadership within the police. So it's a leadership a challenge. It's a training challenge. It's a resources challenge. It's a strategy challenge. So overall, we've got a big problem that needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency, uh, and not only by the police. We have different uh, uh, government part departments that are, are responsible that can come in with crime prevention, but also we as a society, has to take ownership as well. And we have to take hands with the police. And together, we must find a solution because we can see at the moment with the police trying to do their, their best to, 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 to combat crime, it is not working. To me, is the, the sense of urgency that comes when you talk about security in South Africa because the state is not abating. While waiting for uh, the top situation, the top brass to get their arts together, what are in, at the basic level to soften the relationship and improve security um, uh, connection in um, uh, communication between the police, the security uh, apparatus, and the people? What can be done in the immediate to uh, closest future? Uh, uh, if you look at community centered policing, uh, uh, that, that is something that, that is, is in principle being dealt with in South Africa, but I don't believe it is being optimized. It can be further built on. The community can also become more involved. Uh, you know, the main challenge that you have with the community is a trust between the community and the police that is not what it is supposed to be, what it, it could have been. So we have to work on that. But at the other hand, you know, these criminals live between us. They're amongst us, and, uh, and if we tolerate them, and we do not work against them and take hands with the police to work against them. At the end of the day, we're not going to win the battle. At the end of the day, uh, it will, we will need a holistic approach. You know, because if you look at the, the, the crime combating strategies uh, that we have followed for the past 20 years, it has not worked. It, it was not successful. South Africa has become more, one of the most violent countries uh, in the world. We have a murder rate uh, currently of about 74 people per day that are being killed. And that is also amongst the highest in the world. So our strategies have not been working. I think it's back to the drawing board. We have to take hands and we have to come together to find a solution. Concern at the legislative arm um, about the the relationship between security apparatus and the people because there are news for us that don't live directly in south africa we hear the news coming out of there communities are you know engaging in self-help to protect themselves because of a growing distrust of the police what are you hearing at the legislative level and in in, in your capacity there what are you doing to help um, manage the situation the Democratic Alliance believes in a whole of society approach and we need to recognize that at this stage a lot of the resources, human and physical resources that is currently allocated to police stations is done according to what they call a fixed establishment. This fixed establishment and that allocation of resources is still based on the 2006 census. Now um, in 2006 for instance in Gauteng alone there was approximately 9 million people. At this stage, we have almost tripled. We are now close to 19, 20 million people 
recorded in South Africa. Um, you know, in, in Gauteng alone, there's only 143 police stations. Um, 143 police stations, is it's it's inadequate to look after 19, 20 million people. Um, you know, and this is why in the, the recent months, we've seen a lot of um, increases in mass murders, for instance. And we are highly dependent on a, on a whole society approach with the relationship of both security companies, um, the security cluster stakeholders, CPFs, um, which is the Community Policing Forums in South Africa, um, which does have some legislative powers to also hold the police accountable and report directly to the MEC within that specific province. Now, that is currently not, not being done. For a couple of years during COVID, um, CPFs didn't even relaunch and have their proper AGMs. And uh, we are now in a process where these AGMs are being held again so that we can reestablish the community policing forums. But we also need more patrollers, um, you know, where we can have a, a, a proper relationship and re-establish the relationship between the community and um, and the police so that they can help us as a department also and the legislative arm um, to identify where the shortcomings is so that as a legislature we can try and do more allocate allocation of resources to these communities that really needs it. If you had to look at places like, for instance, Suwetu and Alexandra, um, where some of these uh, mass murders have been taking place, tavern shootings, etc., over the last year, as well as places like Alderada Park, um, for instance, where there's people being killed on a daily basis due to gangsterism. We we should be able to have proper profiling um, from the department side and the legislative arm to, to be able to identify which areas are hot spots so that you can allocate resources to, to these areas. But at this stage, exactly um, what the other speaker said is that, you know, uh, there is no political will at this stage to fix it. And until we fix the political will and the leadership issue um, within the department uh, from a national level all the way to a municipal level, and we can establish a proper intergovernmental as well as an interdepartmental approach where we can look at safety um, education pro programs in schools, where we can work with social development to address the social economic issues that relates to crime or, or leads to crime, um, we will not be able to address this properly. So, you know, although we have got the political will to fix it, we will first need to um, work through a lot, a lot of barriers and stumbling blocks and we can fight for it. And this is one of the things that we have done in the Gauteng legislature is to, is to, to push through a motion, the establishment of a committee of inquiry um, to try and determine what the, the cause of these mass murders are in places like Suwete, Alderada Park, Alexandra, etc. All right. If I may jump in here um, from a very skeptical position, uh, what, what, you both seem to agree on something that there is a leadership challenge. There has to be a will, a political will from the top. But there is a situation that is on the ground and needs immediate response of some sort to begin to address it. Let's start, for instance, with the proliferation of uh, firearms. Uh, I mean, the case of the family that was killed, it was guns that was used, and that's a growing conversation. So what is being done about addressing access to gun and just, you know, the situation with guns in South Africa generally, one way to uh, combating crime? Uh, William, the question is to you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I think we have to uh, step back once more and, and look at the strategy that we've been followed on, on, on countering guns and the proportion of guns uh, since 1994, and clearly it has not worked. Uh, so I think it's time for us to sit back and say, okay, it did not work. What should we do now? Let's look at the out-of-the-box solutions. For instance, uh, we have uh, some of the stringent, strictest uh, uh, gun licensing laws uh, in the world. Uh, it, it is supposed to be well policed. We, we have several challenges within the police with the with the firearm act and the administration of the act. And also, we found that uh, the police is in many in, in many cases the main supplier of illegal firearms uh, to to the criminals. 
uh, for one, uh, when uh, some of them are selling uh, the the uh, illegal fire and confiscated firearms, and also uh, we we see that policemen are losing their firearms. They are negligent with the firearms. So gun control within the police is not what it is supposed to be. So we might be, we have to 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 look at that, and also the criminal uh, element within that. We have uh, seen several cases in the past where firearms. Uh, from the police and also the military were rented out to criminals that perpetrated the acts and then they gave it back to these people and the the firearms were never traced because they are part of the the establishment's firearms so those are one some of the of the reasons also another challenge that we have is our porous borders you know south africa has got extremely porous borders and we found that uh, extreme amount of Firearms are actually being smuggled uh, across the border. And now, some time ago, we we picked up that uh, there were some hand weapons, some some pistols that actually came in th through South Africa illegally from a neighboring country, uh, uh, Ishwatini. So that is that is one of the challenges that we can also have to address is is, is your 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 border control. Uh, so what we will need to do is we will need to, it's no use to target the legal fire uh, uh, arm owners because these guys are really under a, a, a strict burden on how to safe keep their, their firearms, how to use it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem that we have is the illegal firearms that are coming in and that are uh, uh, amongst uh, the criminals. And it seems to be freely available amongst these criminals. In your suggestion can be done to address or curb it a little. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we have to relook re at our, our legislation. You know, South Africa is also one of the overregulated uh, countries in the world with the most legal, uh, laws, but uh, it, when it comes to implementing those laws, we seem to not be faring that well. So that it may be some way we, we can have, uh, have a look at. And also, you know, uh, when you when you, you as a, a government, uh, instead of alienating your, your legal firearms owners, uh, bring them in the loop, uh, 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 work together with them in finding solutions, sit around the table. And then also uh, what we can uh, look at, you know, South Africa police has lost the, the majority of its, uh, its, its know-how and of its skills uh, in recent years. And we see there was a, a huge move of that skill set to, to the private sector, to private security companies, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe there should be a forum that sit around the table to see how they can come on board as well to assist the police in the work that they are doing. What we are trying to suggest is that we have to look at out-of-the-box solutions in how we're going to curb this, because the solutions that we used to use and that we tried in the past did not really uh, bring uh, the, the required results. And then also, uh, once again, uh, uh, Prasan mentioned the, the CPF, the Community Policing Forums. I think South Africans need to become more involved in that. They have to take ownership of their own neighborhoods. If there are illegal firearms in the neighborhood, they can report it and we can get rid of that through that means as well. You took that last question right out of my mouth because as much as you, know, you, you both say that there is, it has to start from the top, the people, these people at the top are servants to the people. So, Kirsten, in closing, I want to ask you, um, how can the people make the leaders do the right thing as against standing on the sidelines and waiting for things to happen to them? I think a tendency that South Africans have is that, you know, there's two elements to it. Either they protest or they lock themselves up in their homes and they almost uh, dig their heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening around them. And um, I think we need a, a safe middle way where people do st step up, raise their hand and become um, part of a solution. And I think that would be the very first step that South Africans should take is that in every single community in South Africa, there should be a CPF, a community policing forum. And if they don't know who it is, they should make contact with um, the, the local police station. You know, that, that could be the very first step that they can take is Go and contact the local police station, um, contact your local security companies if you've got security companies in the area, contact your councillor um, in the area, which is the very uh, first sphere of, gov of government, is your municipal council. So contact these people and ask them how can they get involved in the, um, in the local CPF. You'll see CPFs often, um, they have taken up a much bigger role than just uh, policing or patrolling the streets. They look at um, issues, for instance, where there's long grass, which could become a hideout for criminals. 
and together as a community they will cut the grass and you know ensure that it's visible in the area they will they will claim back their public spaces as a cps okay so Grayson, I, I need to interject i'm told we have less than a minute so if you can just wrap up in about 10 oh. seconds that would be great okay so yes i think bottom line is people should just raise their hand make contact with their local councillor make contact with their local police and step up and become involved um, participates in local patrols in my community and if they see anything that is illegal um, you know all of concern to to raise it immediately with the police we we need okay. to speak up we can't be quiet and we need to back our property thank you very much Grace and Bosch for speaking with us as well thank you William Ells we appreciate your time and your thoughts thank you let's take a minute break when we return we'll be looking at South Africa again, where the High Court has ordered that all lactating pregnant mothers and children below six years be given access to free health services. Do stay with us.